your case isn't the first time you've run for office. It is not the first time you've run to be mayor of the city of Chicago. So why do you want to be mayor right now of a city that many say is in a bit of a crisis? Well, because it is in more than a bit of a crisis. And I think the issues that the city is facing, public safety, quality schools, and um, financial mismanagement, uh, it lends itself to my talents and it lends itself to uh, um, uh, turnaround assignments I've been given in the past. So uh, I think my, my skills uh, as uh, someone who understands public safety and, and is financed um, um, citywide community policing initiatives in the past during the daily administration, someone who really transformed the schools uh, when I was CEO of the Chicago Public Schools and someone who has consistently balanced multi-billion dollar budgets in, in more than one city, I think those skills lend themselves to the tasks at hand. But why? I mean, you could do why? something because else. This, because this is a city I love. I'm a public servant. My, I've done nothing but uh, um, public service in my entire career. And, and I've always gravitated toward uh, institutions in crisis. I mean, three generations of, of Vallises have, have made, uh, you know, have lived and, and, and have, uh, have uh, thrived and prospered in this city. I, I come from a family of six veterans and four police officers, now three, because one became a firefighter, two, two firefighters, in fact, in, in our, our wider family, three teachers, and of course, Greek restaurateurs. So, it's, for us, it's been the American dream, but it's also been an American dream that has included public service. Okay. Uh, you, um, in your plan, you want to return CPD, talking, switching to crime here, and public safety. You want to return CPD staffing levels, levels to 13,500 officers. But how do you recruit these officers at a time when that is a real struggle? I mean, recruitment's a problem. Well, you know, th through a combination of things. First of all, you have to stop the exodus of officers. And as you know, I stepped in and for free worked to help negotiate a contract between the city and the FOP, an eight-year contract. The police had not had a contract in, fi in five years. There were, in almost five years, there were close to 2,000 police who were ready to retire had that contract not been consummated. So I've got the confidence of the rank and file police. And I believe if I go in and replace Brown and his leadership team by promoting people from within who are well respected and known to the community and are competent, if I return the police to normal work schedules, if I return to a strategy of community-based policing where police are covering every beat, they're not being moved all over the city, and if I stop punishing the uh, police for being proactive and responsive, I'm absolutely convinced that I'll significantly slow the exodus of police officers while simultaneously making it attractive to be a Chicago police officer again. So you, you touch on many things I want to ask you about, but let's sure. do with let's talk uh, more specifics and touching on that last point. Um, how do you recruit specifically? I saw in your plan that one thing you're proposing is you don't have to live in the city of Chicago during your probationary period, but tuck your wire in, please. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. It's sorry, not your fault. Sorry, my, no, 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 it's fault? okay. No, just tuck the wire in. Okay. No. Yeah. So. Um, Sorry about that. Well, no, it's not your fault. All right, so let me tell you how you recruit. Well, yeah, specifically. Well, the first thing is, you know, the first thing is you have to make it attractive to be a Chicago police officer again. When my son returned from Afghanistan, he is a combat veteran, combat medic in Afghanistan, he couldn't get on the list to take the, fire, the police officer's exam because there were so many. And, and this was, I think, five, six years ago. So, you know, the, you know, the, uh, this used to be the job that everybody wanted. And, and if you do the things that I've articulated, I think you will slow the exodus and make it attractive to be a police officer again. But there are a number of things that you could also do in the meantime. Uh, first of all, you can remove the obstacles for police officers returning to the police department. In fact, uh, you know, she has basically, or I should say, the police department has told individuals who, are, who want to return and would return in the new leadership that they can't be a member of the union or they, they're going to have to go back to training or they're going to lose their seniority. So you can invite people back. You could remove the obstacles to other police departments, uh, officers in other police departments who might want to become Chicago police. And the third thing, uh, the third what thing. What are those obstacles? Well, it, you know, just the, 
additional training you have to go through. There's all sorts of, uh, it's like a bureaucratic maze if you want to transfer into the Chicago Police Department. On the other hand, people are poaching our officers all the time. But there's a couple other things you can do too, is uh, you can invite retired officers to return. You can extend their, uh, their health care. Other police departments have supplemented their police ranks through retired officers. And there's actually a fourth thing you could do too. There are hundreds of police, uh, former police officers who work in the city. Uh, um, and f like hundreds of firefighters used to be Chicago police officers. In LA, Sup in Superintendent Burke, who was uh, Beck, who was the interim superintendent in Chicago, actually had a police reserve co consisting of police, former police officers who, in effect, uh, uh, had other jobs in the city, but th they could be drawn on in an emergency or when there were shortages to come in and supplement the police. So you can do all those things in combination, but until you make it popular, until you make it, uh, until you make being a police officer is something that people want to do because you have the right leadership, you have the right strategy, and you have the right support, you're going to continue to have difficulty filling vacancies. Uh, one thing you mentioned specifically, and you just touched on it, is you want to supplement the detective divisions with retired officers, but how many positions are we actually talking about? And overall, how do you pay for this? Well, first of all, let me point out that, that right now there are a, close to 1,100 additional police, uh, police positions in the budget that, uh, that are not filled. And because those police positions are not filled, they're paying overtime, uh, they're paying an annual overtime that was five times the level of overtime that we paid when I was city budget director and we had 13,500 police officers on the street. So at the end of the day, um, implement the budget, uh, fill those positions. So, uh, you know, uh, by filling the positions, you're going to significant, you're going to save a uh, uh, hundred million dollars in, 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 in uh, annual overtime. And let's look at the CTA. The CTA is spending a hundred million dollars on privatized security, privatized security. Now this is privatized security, minimum wage security, not really trained, no arrest power. They don't carry weapons. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want them to carry weapons. For $100 million, you could increase the number of police officers uh, walking, uh, walking the platforms at the police stations by 300. You could take the 200 officers that are already there, police officers, and you could raise it to 500 without spending a dime more than you're currently spending on the privatized security. So it's a question of priorities. Understood, uh, and I was gonna ask you about this, so let's just jump there. Um, if you implement that CTA plan, there is already a police shortage. So then wouldn't you be robbing Peter to pay Paul? Because now you're taking these additional police officers and assigning them to the CTA and now they're not well, in Well, not beach. necessarily, because if you, re if you reduce, if you uh, bring the type of leadership in and you engage in the type of police strategy, and if you provide the police with support, if you do those basic things, there's no reason why you can't significantly slow the exodus of officers and give yourself the opportunity to catch up. You see, because that's, I mean, you know, on an annualized basis, maybe 300 to 400 officers would leave a year. Now a thousand are leaving a year. When you go back to 400 and, and you have double classes and you maybe even create a third class uh, of, of officer candidates, going through the, maybe the State Police Academy. My wife was a police officer. Both my wife and my son went through the police academy for other police districts, but they went through the police academy. I mean, if you do those basic things, then, then you're gonna quickly catch up. Plus, if you remove the obstacles to officers returning, because under new leadership, with a more supportive mayor, there's hundreds of officers that have indicated, at least through the Fraternal Order of Police, that they'd like to return. If you're recruiting aggressively on a military basis and removing the obstacles to these military veterans to come in and be officers, and if you're bringing back retiree officers, and you can incentivize them by simply extending their retiree health care, uh, which they end up play, paying through the nose for. If you do those core things, I submit to you, you're going to very quickly fill the ranks and you're going to be able to not only have enough police officers to, pro to provide beat integrity so that every police beat has officers who can respond in real time, but it'll also give you enough police officers so that it is now safe to take public transportation in Chicago. So how many officers, you brought this up, do you think would actually be willing to return to the department under new leadership? 
Well, you know, it, it's hard to say, but I would submit to you that, you know, perhaps as many as 200 officers would want to return. I also think because um, uh, Chicago was always a destination uh, uh, place for officers from other police districts up until four or five years ago. And, and you know, the city actually did, uh, uh, began a more aggressive recruiting campaign on military bases that somehow they abandoned because apparently the person was was running, who was running the program, got into the crosshairs of the mayor's office and she was demoted. Uh, you know, a number of officers have told me that. So clearly there are many, so many th more things that can be done to swell the pull of, of uh, quality candidates uh, to basically return or to be recruited from other districts or recruited from the military to come in and fill the ranks. Realistically, in your opinion, how long then would it take to get back up to 13,500? It would not be an instant thing. It would probably take a year, two, three. It would not, but if you invited officers to return, number one. Number two, if you... Um, and not lose seniority. And not use, lose seniority from the time they left. Number two, if you brought retirees in, because many large urban districts have brought retirees in. New York, I think, uh, uh, during the 80s brought like 500 retirees in. And if you extend their health care, if you extend their, their retiree health care, that is a major incentive. Uh, and, and, and if you, to, to cover certain shortages while you're building the ranks, if you invite former police officers who perhaps work uh, for the fire department or other agencies to come in, renew their certification, and to come in and fill certain gaps, special events, um, crisis situations, you can tap into a poll of officers, maybe individual districts are short. If you do those things, you can quickly, quickly supplement the ranks. But I submit to you that when I become mayor and I, and I lay out a return to community-based policing, I put the police on a normal schedule, they know that we're gonna have, that they're gonna have, uh, that um, we're gonna support them uh, uh, when they're proactive and, and that the, the district is gonna have new leadership. I am absolutely convinced that when I become mayor and, you know, and I replace Brown and his leadership team with officers who have the confidence of the rank and file and I return them to a normal schedule, I, you know, I go back to community-based policing so they've simply got consistency on the communities that they're going to be serving uh, and they know that I'm going to support proactive policing. I'm convinced that I'm going to be able to return the, the exodus, uh, uh, the, the annual exodus of officers back to the, to the normal years. In fact, I think I may do better, particularly if I commit to extending uh, retiree health care, restoring retiree health care, which, which ha has, ha has really disincentivized officers uh, uh, and, and, and which has really hurt officers. So I'm convinced that I can significantly close the exodus while incentivizing officers to come back to the district by not penalizing them, by not, uh, you know, um, hurting their, their seniority, by, uh, you know, by extending uh, uh, retiree health care for retired officers that I would like to return to come in and supplement. I'm going all over the place. No, but I, I, I understand. So with, with the in, incentivizing these returning retired officers, can the city afford to extend their health benefits, or would that be part of the already existing police budget? Well, look... Every budget can be reprioritized. Uh, you know, every budget needs to be scrutinized. You know, I'm confident that you could restore in, uh, retiree health care, particularly for those individuals uh, who are first responders, you know, without busting the budget. Um, it, sometimes it's just providing them with a, affordable health care, not comprehensive gold-plated health care plans. But uh, f for many who retire who are, not Medicaid, who are not yet Medicaid eligible, they get hit with huge retiree costs right. and and so that sometimes that can be ex excessive uh, and, and you know and once again there's ways to tackle the health health care costs in a comprehensive way because let's face it you know the city has comprehensive uh, uh, usually expensive uh, 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 health care uh, health care costs and and simply adding retirees particularly retirees that are returning to fill uh, you know, the detectives division or to provide technical support uh, for the detectives division when it comes to investigating their cases. These type of things are not going to be are not going to be budget busters. OK, a uh, couple more uh, public safety uh, issues. You've talked about um, 
allowing police to do their jobs. But CPD, of course, currently is under a consent decree yeah. because of a history or born out of a decades long history of the abuse of power, uh, often illegal conduct, and many believe outright racist practices. So how do you balance your call for restoring effective policing with reform? Well, nothing that I've proposed in any way is in violation of the consent decree. What we're talking about is police making arrests. If you go out side right now and talk to a police officer and ask the police officer whether or not uh, they feel confident that if they uh, pursue someone who has uh, shoplifted, pursue somebody uh, who has, uh, has uh, violated the public way, damaged public or private property, or for that matter even put, uh, 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 knock somebody down or assaulted somebody, they'll tell you that uh, you know, they, they feel that they're being handcuffed, they're, they feel that they're being restrained. Restoring proactive policing or responsive policing is not stop and frisk. It's simply allowing police officers to enforce ordinances, enforce laws that are already on the books, and arresting people for stealing, arresting people for, 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 uh, uh, you know, for carjacking, arresting people for damaging public and private property. Uh, you know, disrupting the public way where, where you know, people who are walking the street are, are basically intimidated or threatened and sometimes punched and pushed down. And police will tell you that uh, they, feel, uh, they feel literally handcuffed or they feel restrained. Also, let me point out that we have gone through a period in which there has been uh, a, a historic increase in crime. This month alone, crime is up, I think, 31, it's up... Uh, 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 almost 60 percent violent crime is up 60 percent higher than it was last year so we're already starting the year with crime much higher than it was last year in fact crime in the cta is up 36 percent all the way through the first three weeks of january of last year so things are getting worse not better but yet uh the number of arrests last year was 76 percent lower than they were in 2019 before COVID. so crime is skyrocketing skyrocketing Yet we've had seen a record decline in arrests. What does that tell you? That tells you that the police are not being proactive. That tells you that the police are not arresting people who are committing violent crimes. And, and if you look at the arrest rate for murders, one in six, if you look at the arrest rate for shootings, 5%, if you look at the uh, arrest rate for burglaries, for uh, arrest rate for, for, for uh, stealing cars, which incidentally, uh, 2,200 stolen cars already this year, just in the first 22 days, it's two and a half percent. Clearly the police aren't making arrests. Well, there's many reasons for that. Some, it's, I know I've heard too, they feel that they're not empowered and well, that they won't be supported. Right. Part of it also is the, well, we'll arrest them, but then they won't be prosecuted. So there's also that, and well, part of it's a police too. shortage. So there are, I know it's a well, multi-tiered a, reason for, for no the, but the restraints on proactive policing is a is a big part of it too, and and and. What do you mean they could get more? Fi you know, right now a lot of officers are afraid to let's say someone pushes them; they're afraid to be able to even physically grab them to cuff right. them. So, would you work to restore that sort of capability, for lack of a better way to term that question? You you know what I mean? How do you balance that? Well. You balance it, first of all, by having the, the right supervision. I mean, when you talk about not complying with the consent decree, um, they still haven't complied with the requirement that there be one sergeant for every 10 officers, so you don't really have effective supervision. There's severe shortages in terms of the supervisory ranks. Uh, uh, you know, they've fallen far short when it comes to the training and the retraining of officers. There's been big criticism of that. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, proactive policing is making arrests when people Vi you know, violate the law when, when basically that violation warrants someone coming in and making an arrest. And you're right, they're absolutely intimidated because they're afraid if they do anything, they don't follow a rule, they cross the line. The, the adverse consequences are going to fall, are going to fall on them. And, and look when it comes to uh, chasing someone who has committed a crime. It's not that they won't let them chase, it's that they've hit them with so many rules you literally have to go through a whole checklist be, before you are allowed to chase, and then there's a, a whole series of, of, of things that can that require that you terminate the chase. Just remembering what you have to do to initiate the chase, and then what you then must do to end the chase, 
it would it would baffle the mind, baffle the imagination. I mean, so, so much. So you'd review oh, some of that. Yeah, it, well, you know, what I would do is I would allow them to make the, you know, I would allow them to chase, and I would establish sensible rules uh, that are understandable and they're clear. But clearly, we want police officers to be able to pursue criminals who have who have committed violent crimes. And right now, the officers feel are almost fearful of doing that because they fear the consequences, being penalized or being basically. Uh, reprimanded or for that matter or even being terminated the officers do not feel supported the officers feel under siege okay quickly because okay. We're, we're we're wow um, it sounds like you and just say yes or no it sounds like you'd like to replace Brown with someone from the inside uh, yes but not only Brown but the but his leadership team I think you have to really important you have to end the friends and family promotion system mm -hmm. that basically promotes people into the exempt ranks based on who they know and not often their time and grade and their experience. Okay, you, uh, final question related to policing. Many criticize the FOP as being far too right and anti-reform, especially when it comes to its president, John Canizera. Does your FOP endorsement and your ties to the FOP hurt or help you? Well, look, the rank and file vote for uh, you know, for the endorsement, not John Canton, Sarah, or even his executive team. It actually comes up through the delegates. So, so the overwhelming support I have among rank, rank and file police officers is why I've been endorsed by the FOP. But let me point out that you've got to work with the unions, whether it's the Chicago Teachers Union, whether it's the Fraternal Order of Police. I don't get to pick who their leaders are. You just have to negotiate with them. And I was able to negotiate. I'm talking about with voters, though. Do your ties to this? I don't think it's going to hurt me because crime is the number one issue. And I think when people say, oh, my God, uh, you know, he has the FOP support, that means, uh, uh, you know, he's... Uh, uh, he has close ties to John Catanzara. You know, I think people realize that that's just trying to change the subject. People understand that if, if any of the unions support you, it's generally because you've got strong support from the rank and file members. I also want to point out that the contract that we negotiated uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the FOP included all the accountability provisions that people have been calling for and that have been negotiated and approved by the city council for the sergeant's contract. So at the end of the day, we negotiated the contract and we included the accountability provisions. The most important thing though is we kept 2,000 police officers from leaving and just imagine where we'd be without just a, a 1,700 reduction in police strength since Rahm Emanuel, but a 3,700 reduction in police strength. Okay, moving on to CPS. All right. Uh, you talk about reducing CPS's central office uh, to push the money down to schools, yeah. but how many positions are you talking about in terms of reductions, and how much money are we actually talking about that you would save that you would then push down to schools? Well, let me point out that when I ran to schools back in the day when school enrollment was actually was, was actually increasing significantly, and we actually had to open up 78 new buildings, most of which to deal with the overcrowding, uh, we were able to take a billion dollar structural deficit, and six years later, we left the district Gary Chico and I, with almost a billion dollars in cash balances. The fact remains that about 60% of the money uh, that, uh, you know, and they're spending $30,000 a student, that only about 60% of that money finds its way in, into classroom instruction. So, and it's due to a variety of reasons. It's due, obviously, to the central office bureaucracy and, and the number of administrators, but it's also due to all these you know, you know, the Sodexo contracts and the Marriott contracts and some of the privatized contracts that are basically, not the Marriott, the Sodexo and the Aramar contracts, sorry Marriott, now the, uh, the, the contracts that are costing the district a small fortune. I mean, there are, 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 there are contract expenditures and, and, and there are also district-wide programs that are run by the central office that could, uh, that could be, uh, you know, that could be easily replaced by giving the money to the local schools and letting the local schools pick and choose their programs. So at the end of the day, there's no reason why uh, only 60% of the $9.4 billion that, uh, that constitutes the Chicago Public School budget should find its way into the classroom. So I'm confident, as I've done before, in not only Chicago but other districts, that I'll be able to decentralize the district uh, and, and, and push the money down to the local schools. But you can't quantify that in terms of positions or money? No, I can't quantify that right now, but it's something that I've always done. And, and proof is in the pudding. I've, I've done it, 
I've done it in, in, in four different cities. And in New Orleans, when we rebuilt the district, we rebuilt it right. We rebuilt it by prioritizing local funding first. In New Orleans, uh, minus capital, minus the, ca the cost of capital, the cost of operating the building, is only about three to four percent of the money uh, that came in actually was money that was controlled by the central office. Everything was down, was pushed down to the local schools. Um, you talk about capping property taxes, but that will mean ultimately lost revenue, lost tax revenue. How do you make up for what inevitably would be a shortfall if you do cap property taxes? Well, what I'm talking right now, you have a levy cap, cap okay? And the levy cap is uh, is uh, both the school district and the city have a levy cap. And, and while the levy cap may cap the property tax levy overall, it doesn't help those people who are in uh, communities that are rapidly gentrifying, where property taxes are climbing, senior citizens, families, etc. What I'm talking about doing is ensuring that there is a cap on individual property tax increases. So I'm not talking about, you know, just capping property tax across the board. I'm talking about keeping individuals keeping individuals from simply being, uh, uh, you know, uh, literally overwhelmed with sudden significant increases in their property tax assessments because... So what the, does that look like in practice? Well, what that looks like in practice is you're a homeowner and, uh, you know, and you're never going to see your property taxes rise by more than 3% a year or you're a businessman. And unless you're making significant improvements to your property or basically making, you know, expanding your operations and things like that, you know, even if you get reassessed at a higher level, you know, you, that that's going to translate, that you're still going to be protected. Uh, you're not going to get an increase beyond 3%. So I'm really talking about capping the type of property tax increases that can really hurt working families, uh, people who rent, because what drives up of the, co the rental costs is, uh, is the fact that property taxes are but that's rising. an assessor issue. That comes to the assessment formula. How no. do you do it on an individual basis? Well, I think what you do is you work with the assessor to legislate a type of property tax cap that is on individual property rather than simply going with an aggregate cap. Because, again, you've got people who are hit really hard. And, and if you're a family on fixed income, if you're someone who's retired, or if you're a business that's struggling, you know, the property tax increase uh, has has no relationship to your capacity to pay. So I think individual property taxes are the way to go. And also, let me point out that, that you know the mayor controls twenty eight billion dollars in spending. This is not sixteen point seven bill. It's not. It's just not her sixteen billion dollars city budget. It's the CHA, the CTA, it's the schools. It's the uh, uh, the you know the schools consume sixty percent of your property taxes. And uh, it's the um, it's the airports, it's the water department, it's you know it's the parks, it's the city colleges. You know, if you can't uh, in a twenty eight billion dollar budget lay out a financial plan that addresses the needs of public safety, uh, you know, addresses the needs of public education, and, and provide uh, city services without draconian increases in property tax every year, then you're basically in in the law the, the Wrong line of work. Uh, when I was city budget director, we didn't increase property taxes at all. Yet we had our bond ratings uh, uh, rolls every year, and and we uh, and we did not um, you know we did not borrow. We did not defer obligations to the next generation. And and as a, a school superintendent, I always operated under a very restrictive property tax cap. So you know I've managed these multi-billion-dollar budgets responsibly before, and I'll do it in the future. Uh, we're almost out of time. What's one thing people don't know about you? What, uh, what's one thing people don't know about me? Uh, you know, I don't know. I think, you know, I've been in the public, you know, I've been in the public uh, eye for so many years. There's probably very little, uh, other than the fact that I watch a movie every night, which is kind of weird. So it's, and, and I've now watched so many movies. If anyone out there has some if there are some really good art movies out there, there are some really good, like, you know, the avant-garde movies or, uh, you know, that, uh, the, you know, the little, you know, the, like, artistic B-movies out there that I might have not seen, please send them to me because I'm almost out of movies and, and, and I find myself going back to some of the old classics, so to speak. So. I, I see. That's a good one. That, that is something people wouldn't know about you. I've been very impressed with these uh, in a, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that sort of way. Finally, and this is it, uh, and this is another question I'm asking every candidate. 
Um, if you are mayor, will I be safer? Yes. Okay, well, that was the shortest <laughs> answer you gave in 30 minutes. All right, we're good. We're good.